fluorescence from it. This is what it looks like. Okay, so here you have a signal which is just normalized, but it's just the fluorescence of um, that blob of that uh, the defect in the diamond. A high fluorescence indicates one state, a low fluorescence, uh, the, the lowest fluorescence indicates the, the other state, and everything in between is a superposition of quantum states, right? Uh, one can actually do uh, some complicated math called average Hamiltonian theory to actually uh, uh, determine to first order how this signal, this fluorescence difference, uh, actually depends on the tiny little detuning delta that uh, we, we want to measure. And there's a tiny little delta here uh, in, this, in this very big in this very big formula. It doesn't matter. What matters is that as you Fourier transform this, uh, this signal, you get a sort of spectrum, okay? And the main point of this spectrum-like thing that just appeared in your screen is the fact that as you acquire for longer and longer, you get more well-resolved peaks in your spectrum. That is, you can actually um, detect tinier and tinier magnetic fields. So that's just to show you like how one such experiment goes. But don't forget that the big idea is just this, to have a tiny little sensor that can work at, say, even room temperature and that can measure the signal caused by single or, or just a couple of spins. Okay? Questions on this? Actually, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, this is really cool because I, I know absolutely nothing about this other than the pop psi of having uh, heard about NV center diamonds as qubits and, you know, uh, NMR. But um, so one of my uh, questions is, is the NMR keeping the qubit, you, you said it was keeping it protected, or that's maybe not yes. your exact words, but is it because it's... Uh, um, it's resonating at a frequency that, hmm. well, let me ask the other question, which I put in the chat. Is, is it keeping it in the excited one state and simply no. varying the phase? No, what you're doing is effectively cycling through the zero and one states. That, that's the answer to the first question. It's you, with this microwave, you are making the qubit sort of go from zero to a superposition of zero to one to one. And this is seen in this signal that you see here. The, uh -huh. the highest points of the signal uh, indicate that you are in one of the states. So this signal is just normalized fluorescence, right? And I told you in the beginning that that uh, blob fluoresces at different mean intensities if the spin is up or yeah. down. Can you see the arrow? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, so that's neat. So it's not actually extending that two microseconds to a longer time. It's just if you hit it enough, you're you're gonna have. Um, uh, it's weird. It's kind of like a sampling approach. Like if you're turning on and off this uh, frequency, then you'll have so more. It, yeah, you are right that it, there is some sort of driving approach in the sense that this uh, you are applying a microwave continuously so it's it's the same thing so driven quantum systems they tend they tend to live longer as quantum systems but they tend not to have very sensitive sensing properties it's it's a, it's so something that i'm not mentioning is that there is a trade off um if you um if you do If you, um, so, what I mean is that uh, there's a theory in, in one of my papers that show that um, if you drive the system, so if you wait too long between uh, phase flips, uh, your your driven system will behave as a quantum entity for longer, but it will have poor sensitivity. It's not going to be to send to be able to sense tiny 
magnetic fields. Okay. On the other hand, uh, it's going to, to be uh, well protected against a class of noise. On the other hand, if you flip your, uh, uh, your phase very quickly, uh, your coherence time is going to be uh, uh, shorter, and, uh, but you're going to be able to have a better sensitivity. So the advantage of this method is the trade-off because the, experiment can the experimenter can choose uh, which um, interval between phase flipping to correct for whichever noise exists in your system. For instance, one very common source of noise is spin noise is the noise that comes from uh, interactions with other spins in the carbon lattice, right? There are um, uh, substitutional phosphorus spins, carbon-13 spins, and all those interactions are going to, to make your sensor uh, work not as well. That, that's a reason, for instance, that the really good uh, diamond sensors are made in, say, iso isotopically pure diamond. Okay, diamonds where there are carbon 12 doesn't have a spin, carbon 13 does. So that if you only have carbon 12 nuclear spins, like like it, it's spin, uh, the carbon 12 atoms, um, your sensing effective electronic spin will not suffer the effect of this what's called spin bath. Other uh, noise examples are like a noise in your machinery, right? Noise in your microwave generator, for instance. Okay. Thank you. So uh, there are two types of noise. And if you think about a two level system, it's, it's uh, qu quite cool. One top type of noise is like noise in the, it's, uh, how do I say this? One type of noise is like, noise in like in uh, that, that that changed the the mean um energy between the two levels and there's another type of noise which is like how much one one single level is sort of uh, vibrating or or um, oscillating in energy very quickly it's it's a very uh, so i opted in this presentation not to present a lot of uh, technical details but uh, you're more I, I'm super happy to talk to you and, and, and tell you everything more in a more mathematical language later on. Sure yeah this this uh, it, it certainly um, at least uh, answered my curiosity about this. I'll let you continue. Thank you. Awesome. Okay then again I'm happy to talk more about that. With this I ask a question? The, oh. Yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. How are you um, actually measuring your infidelity in between each phase or when you're changing your phases? Oh, um, uh, you, you, you mean um, the, the, uh, the infidelity as reflected in how well we are flipping the spin or how well we are actually driving? Um, in this case, how well is it actually maintaining its, you know, one or zero state, um, if that makes sense? Uh, so it's, it's oscillating between the zero and the one state. In this signal as a function of interrogation time, which is just the time during which you apply your microwave, you see that uh, the fluorescence uh, oscillates between the minimum, which is, say, state, state one, and the maximum, which is state zero. Anything in between is a superposition of zero and one. Importantly, what you see is that actually this um, uh, this uh, signal is actually uh, uh, decaying, right? Can, can you guys see that there's there's a tendency to decay to to something in between uh, the maximum and the minimum? Yeah. Yeah, we can see that. Right. Yes. So, so, so um, this is not like the infidelity, but this is like the effect of your, of, of the noise that the electron is seeing, right? So I guess, oh, yes. Sorry. 
What, what's your question? Tell, tell me. A continuation on that question then. How yeah. are you ensuring that what you're doing is in a quantum state versus a classical state? Um, so, um, every measurement um, actually projects the spin state either in zero or in one, right? So uh, what you read in the end is a definite, either zero or one. Uh, yes. What you do, right? What you do is you take a lot of, uh, of you repeat this, the experimental sequence many, many times. So each one of those points in this curve uh, is the result of an average of say, 100,000 to 300,000 uh, individual experiments. And on average, right, you know that um, if it's at the highest intensity, you are, you are like really at the, the zero state. If you are in the minimum, you are really at the one state. And anything in between needs to be in a uh, superposition. I um, and there are methods to calibrate that uh, to, to calibrate this intensity by preparing the states in a uh, if you have heard of it uh, in a way called adiabatic passage, so that you can actually um, make sure that they are really in the states that you want it to be, and, and calculate by how much it's fluorescing, and then so that everything in between needs to be in a. Uh, uh, in a, in, a, in a superposition state. Uh, if it were a classical state, what uh, when all the, 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 the quantum is gone and you can see it from this signal, you have a, a mixture of, of uh, uh, one state and the other state so that you would have a flat line around the maximum and the minimum. And this would be the signature of a classical state, but anything before is really a quantum oscillation on average, right? Oh, okay, great. That answered the question for me. Thank you. Cool. Then again, talk more at any time. But let me talk to you a little bit about, and I'll be very brief here because I want to, 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 to get to where I really want to go. I'm going to talk briefly about another type of quantum sensor, in this case, an imaging sensor that I worked uh, when I was a postdoc at Berkeley. So um, I don't think I need to motivate to this audience that people really want to know what happens in biology at the nanoscale, right? And people uh, generally use microscopes, usually optical microscopes to use to, to look at biological samples. But uh, one of the best types of microscopes ever developed um, are electron microscopes, right? Um, that uh, get, for instance, a scanning electron microscope um, emits a beam of electrons that uh, impinges on a sample. And uh, depending on the scattered electrons, you have a topographical image of your uh, sample. But why do you guys think nobody does this? Why uh, don't people use? Uh, pe why don't people usually use a scanning electron beam on top of of a biological sample? Any ideas? You're Come on. So, so, so <laughs> what's that? You kill the sample. You kill the sample completely, right? So, uh, and sometimes you destroy it so quickly that you can't even get topographical the topographical image right and if you if you want if your sample is precious and you don't want it to die i mean that, then it's never going to happen right so can we do better and we think we can imagine that first of all in between the scanning electron beam and your precious sample imagine that you put a thin nanometrically thin scintillator film a scintillator material is a material that when um it um gets um, uh, when it, it gets hit by uh, radiation such like ionizing radiation such as that uh, from an electron beam it gets excited and uh, as it de-excites it emits light and this light is called cathodoluminescence 
Okay, so we put a tiny cathode luminescence, a, a thin cathode luminescence film in between the electron beam and the sample. The first thing that you see is that the sample is not absorbing most of the radiation. The sample is statistically well protected. But then again, we can do better. We can actually engineer the scintillator to undergo foster resonance energy transfer with the sample. Foster resonance energy uh, transfer is a semi-classical, uh, counterintuitive maybe, um, phenomena that whereby a excited donor transfers energy to a nearby acceptor non-radiatively without the direct emission of a photon. Um, a couple of things uh, have to happen. The scintillator and the, the donor and the acceptor need to be very uh, close, especially, especially, and the uh, donor uh, spectral emission needs to overlap with the acceptor uh, excitation spectrum, right? But uh, we, we can uh, do so, right? We can engineer this scintillator film to actually under, to be a donor for this um, nearby um, encapsulated sample, right? Um, a chromophore in the sample, if it gets energy from the scintillator, a chromophore gets excited. As it de-excites, it emits fluorescence. And if we're smart, we put a tiny uh, mirror inside the vacuum chamber of your scanning electron beam, and you collect that fluorescence. And what you have in effect is a near field optical, um, uh, uh, it's a near field microscopy modality, which is not diffraction limited. In theory, the resolution that we get is only limited by the imprint that the uh, electron beam leaves on the scintillator, because only the scintillator atoms that get excited by this plume of electrons um, are, are actually capable to, to, to transfer the energy to the sample. And moreover, if you um, encapsulate your sample, you can imagine observing nanoscale phenomena with a super good resolution as they happen physiologically. So what it looks like is the following. Our scintillator um, is um, uh, 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 produced on top of a tiny little chip that uh, has one uh, tiny little silicon nitride. Those are nanometrically thin to like from say 10 to 50 nanometers. Uh, silicon nitride is electron transparent. That is the electrons go through. And then we put this chip inside this um, a nice um, 3D printed uh, metal structure there, and the sample flows through this. Okay, uh, I just want to show you, I don't expect you guys to be convinced those were the um, very first images taken um, with this method on a biological sample. And as you see, uh, it still performs worse than a confocal microscope. So what you guys are looking at here are membranes with plenty of chlorophyll. Okay, and those membranes are involved in photosynthetic processes. And what we have is we drop cast them onto one of those chips. And first of all, we find their image onto a confocal uh, laser microscope. And then we find the same image under the this scintillate like this electron beam mediated method, right, which I'm calling uh, SEM fluorescence channel. And as you see, it's not super well resolved, but we can do a, um, a scan of the wavelengths and we confirm that we are getting uh, the, the, the fluorescence of this uh, chlorophyll. Okay, so that's very good. But then again, uh, this were those results were taken about uh, three years ago, so we've made progress, but I won't talk about that. And 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 really, um, the the 
the big picture is this. That's the method, but we still have a long way to go into improving the, the technical details. Questions? What are your questions right now? Um, I guess now I'm going back to the motivation behind this because uh, you were you were comparing that um, uh, on your other slide to the confocal uh, yes. microscopy image. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious if that uh, what's there must be something deficient in this. Is it, is it only because we're looking at 10 <laughs> micrometers, but like if we were looking at one micrometer? No, no. Okay. Uh, th there are many technical issues that need to be solved. Uh, the first one is that even though the electron beam um, width is very, very tiny, is about a couple of nanometers, the plume uh, uh, that, that, that happens when, when that very tiny electron beam impinges onto the scintillator is much wider. So this plume uh, can like, so th the size of this plume depends on the energy of the electrons. And even going to the lower electron energies that we could work with, this plume was still say 300 nanometers or more, right? Uh, which means that our effective resolution is limited by, by 300 nanometers, right? And then there were other issues about um, index of refraction matching between the sample and the scintillator film, which caused a lot of uh, loss of signal. And uh, those are just some of the reasons why this method is not, is, is, is not yet better than a confocal microscope. Okay, so let, let me ask this a different way then. So at best, are what you hope to have happen, um, I'm assuming that at some point you would envision that this surpasses the confocal microscope in terms of resolution? Uh, uh, yes, and um, there are some ways to do so. Now it's more or less clear that using, so, um, using a scanning electron beam maybe is not going to cut it, right? Because the plume is very broad, even at the lowest energy that we can work with experimentally. But there are some other kinds of microscopes, uh, especially one called a helium um, ion microscope. And those have uh, much tighter plumes, okay? So that they, they generate uh, much tighter plumes inside the, the it, it, it's 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 not an electron microscope. It's a helium ion microscope. It's it's the same. It's the same principle. There are helium ions that are bombarded onto the your scintillator, and um, the helium ions actually they 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 cannot scatter as much. So that going for for a setup incorporating this sort of helium ion microscope might make a difference if we were to continue. Um, trying to develop such a method, right? But you're right. Right now, there is no reason why not to, to continue using a confocal microscope. Yeah, I, it wasn't to draw out that point, because obviously, if you're doing this research, there's, um, I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is from your point of view, uh, you're doing this, uh, again, the motivation for the research, um, now that we're this far into the presentation, I'm expecting that you're going to be able to do something that we can't do currently, or or is it is it just to bring? No, uh, and I, I'm I'm telling you where I'm going, right? So, um, oops. Let let me see if this makes everything clear. R right now, I didn't show you anything that that like especially in the second one in the the in the imaging sensor i didn't show you anything that that you cannot do but what ties this part of the presentation together is the fact that those are two examples of quantum sensors of quantum enhanced sensors that worked at room temperature and in noisy environments in the noisy environment of the diamond lattice and in the noisy environment of the proximity to a a biological sample, okay? And this is going to be 
important, especially um, in relationship with what where I'm going. Okay, so if you guys allow me, I'll close the parentheses on this part to talk about really what, I, what I'm super excited about, and that's uh, more related to my current research. And this was actually research that started when I was a postdoc uh, at Stanford with Manu Prakash. So um, before I got to Stanford, those were the sort of sensors, the technological sensors, right, that I that I was used to dealing with. But uh, in the Prakash lab, they do a lot of biophysics. So when I got there, I soon realized that very often nature has ways of surpassing human technology for sensing in the most crazy ways, right? When I was at the Prakash lab, I worked with a light sensor that I won't have time to talk about, but also with a magnetic sensor, okay? But to start talking about this magnetic sensor uh, in biology, I'll have to start talking about biology at the nanoscale, namely the chemistry. So it's known for decades now from basic chemistry that magnetic fields can alter the products of a class of chemical reactions that depend on spin, okay? So um, again, we talked about uh, spins when we were talking about the, the defect, the NV center in diamond, but spins are just a quantum mechanical property that doesn't have a classical analog and it has to do with um, uh, how uh, objects interact with magnetic fields, right? Uh, physicists usually denote spins with an arrow and spin up or down just reflect two different energy states of this merely quantum property called spin. So uh, a class of reaction that depend on spin, and here I'll, I'll talk about a special class of the special class of reactions. Uh, I'm going to talk about photo dependent uh, reactions. It's known that those chemical reactions can be uh, affected by magnetic fields. So in chemistry, uh, I, I, can you guys see the arrows? Am I in the middle of the screen more or less? It depends yeah, we can on... see them. Yeah. You can see that, okay. So let me uh, tell you how this works uh, in chemistry, right? Uh, certain reactions, they start with the absorption of a photon. This photon is going to give enough energy for outer shells, uh, for one outer shell electron uh, in a molecule to um, actually um, uh, be excited, okay? So when one, one, when one is populating the electron cells in, in atoms and molecules, um, the electrons, uh, actually, they when they are paired in the same sort of um, uh, orbital, uh, they, they are paired like in a singlet state, right? One faces up and the other one faces down. And this is just because there's something called the Pauli exclusion principle that says that uh, two electrons uh, cannot occupy the, 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 the same quantum state. So one is spin up and the other one is spin down. So a photon comes and excites one of those electrons um, from this singlet pair. Under most circumstances, this electron is going to be de-excited, right, emitting fluorescence in the process. Sometimes, though, when this electron spin is excited, before it decays back, it can interact with a free-floating charge a free electron nearby. Free electrons are things that are very commonly found in uh, chemical reactions, especially, especially those, say, in, in, bio, in biomolecules, okay? Here's the thing. Because the process started with um, the absorption of a photon, spin conservation rules apply so that when this electron here meets this free charge here, those two need to have the same spin state that those two electrons had. 
that is those two electron spins when they're interacting they start in a singlet state some people in the quantum information community uh, told me that this can also be explained by something called entanglement monogamy i don't fully understand it but i'm just saying if if any of you gets interested but there's a thing about singlet states and not many people think about it in this way singlet states are very non-classical states right singlet states are absolutely quantum states they are entangled states so it's not that uh this process depends on entanglement those two those two spins which are going to be very important for magnetic field sensing it's not that uh, they need to be entangled but entanglement is a consequence of the spin dynamics of the system so there's something that is very different about those uh, two spins this is the fact that this spin uh, is sort of free it doesn't is is not attached or is very weakly attached to to any molecules whereas this guy here sees uh, strong interactions with um, nuclear spins in the molecule where it came from those are called hyperfine interactions okay. this means that in the presence of an external field, this guy here will only see this uh, external magnetic field, and this guy here will see a um, the the external magnetic field plus a much stronger uh, hyperfine field. Those two electron spins uh, have different local magnetic environments, and uh, as you may know, uh, what spins do when they're subject to a magnetic field is they start precessing around this magnetic field and the precession of uh, this precession frequency is known as a Larmor frequency and the point is that uh, different external magnetic fields are going to change mainly the Larmor frequency of this guy here okay and consequently the phase that this guy here acquires is going to be slightly different depending on the external magnetic field effectively what this means is that external magnetic fields are in the end effectively going to change the probability of us finding those two spins in a singlet state or in a triplet state okay so ex an external magnetic field is going to alter uh, how the spins process and this altered precession is going to influence whether the spins are going to be measured by the environment to be in a singlet state or in a triplet state some chemical reactions are spin dependent this means that they proceed through one branch if the spins are found to be in a triplet state and they continue through another branch if the spins are found to be in a singlet state importantly the macroscopic final products of those two branches are different it's in this sense that magnetic fields via this spin dynamics that happens very fast can actually have an effect on a macroscopic effect on the the final products of chemical reactions before i open for questions i just want to tell you that this has been demonstrated at room temperature in solution in the gas phase in the solid phase and for magnetic fields down to uh, the magnetic field strength of the earth okay uh, one way that someone else um, took to explain how this very finicky uh, spin uh, precession quantum transient phenomena uh, can uh, can actually have a big effect is by looking at this leftmost bottom uh, diagram here if you want to engage a tiny little fly to flip a rock to one side or or not if the rock starts at a thermodynamical equilibrium state you're toast the, the fly will never be able to to help uh, tip the the rock 
But if you start with the rock in an out of equilibrium state, in a thermodynamically uh, unstable, like out of equilibrium state, right, with the rock at a, at, a, at a tipping point, then the fly landing on one side or the other might actually make a difference. So in this analogy, the thermodynamically uh, unstable, like out of equilibrium state is a quantum state. Everything that starts uh, quantum dies classical, it thermalizes. So again, and as was for the case of uh, the envy centering diamond, this effect is only noticeable, is only uh, doing the, the field sensing as long as the spins and the interaction among the spins are well described by the laws of quantum mechanics. What are your questions on this chemistry thing that I just explained? This is more of like a general question when you're doing your experiments. When you mentioned that you can detect the field of the earth, but also just, um, so, so I, I didn't mention any experiment yet. Oh, sorry, I probably misheard it then. This, uh, what do so, you mean by uh, demonstrated? This, um, uh, 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 people have done basic chemistry experiments demonstrating this. Oh, okay. Sorry, I misheard. <laughs> no, 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 no. And do you want to continue your question, or was it the sure? I'll continue. Uh, well, yes. Let's say that you did do your experiment at this point. Yes. <laughs> in, yes. In um, how would you separate the the data that you're getting from the Earth relative to the data that you're getting from, uh, let's say, you have a small magnetic field you're inducing? If that makes sense. Um, yes, it does. Um, so um, there are ways of doing Faraday caging, that is to create a, a hypomagnetic uh, chamber where you can, you can do experiments inside and you can apply different magnetic fields inside. That's one way to separate, right? And uh, in the case that you're doing this with magnetic fields much larger, then it doesn't matter, right? The magnetic field of the Earth is about 50 microtesla, which is weaker than the magnetic field when you have your, your cell phone uh, ho close to your, to your ear. Right. Oh, okay. Thank you. So more questions about this mechanism that is demonstrated in basic chemistry. Do you guys buy it? No, 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 no. It's not Steiner's experiment. So this uh, Steiner uh, thing is a um, is a review published in '89, and this is a review of many chemical uh, processes that are known to depend on magnetic fields via a spin process very similar to the one, actually identical to the one that I explained here. All I'm saying is that. Uh, uh, many people, um, they're not aware that this exists, and this is well established in the field of uh, radical chemistry, right? This is just spin physics, and I'm just bringing this up because uh, up to now, I'm, I'm just talking about basic chemistry. And now I'm going to say that uh, in the beginning of the 2000s, um, biophysicists uh, started trying to, to to understand or to postulate how organisms uh, might interact with magnetic fields. For instance, it is known, um, it, it's definitely known that at least as a partial cue, both birds and butterflies and turtles, they use the magnetic field of the earth as a migrating mechanism or they sense them they, they can be at least partially guided by the magnetic field of the earth which as i said is uh is tiny right so they hypothesized that the same chemical mechanism here that that i that, that exists in basic chemistry in like solutions of proteins solutions of molecules 
they hypothesized that the same mechanism might be um, happening inside organisms. Or, in other words, were the same mechanism to be happening inside organisms, organisms would sense magnetic fields to the extent that they would sense different physiological concentrations of products coming from such spin-dependent chemical reactions. Okay, which this hypothesis may seem surprising, right? Because uh, biological things are hot and wet, and we all know that qubits are better uh, protected ag against the coherence if they are, like, say, uh, in very controlled environments, in vacuum, uh, at cryogenic temperatures, right? If you if you look at the photons, uh, the, the photos of Google's quantum computer, they uh, the quantum computer is, is like a, a stuff that lives inside a, 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 a very cold fridge, right? That's because the, the being at cold temperatures or in vacuum uh, decreases the decohering noise, so that you can work with the systems uh, as quantum objects for longer and longer. So this may seem surprising that biology might could be doing this. So, so biophysicists started looking for this in 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 organisms, right? So, uh, since this um, since this phenomenon that I described starts with the absorption of a photon. Uh, Biophysicists started looking for photoreceptors, pigments, say in our eyes or in our cells that absorb light. And at that point, the only animal photoreceptor uh, that exists in our eyes, in the eyes of migrating birds, in the antennas of migrating butterflies, the only photoreceptor that is known to sustain radical pairs uh, at that point was a protein called cryptochrome. Okay, so as I said, cryptochrome exists in our eyes, uh, but it's also, and that's important, in all our cells, like even cells that do not see light because it has uh, circadian rhythm regulation functions. And just a little bit of, of the story of cryptochrome. Cryptochrome um, exists in all of those species there. It's uh, what biologists call very conserved throughout the tree of life. And uh, boxed in red are organisms to which um, experiments uh, having to do with magnetosensing are consistent with them being dependent on cryptochrome. Okay, and yes, humans are right here. This evidence then for cryptochrome-based magnetosensing in this very uh, spin-dependent way, it's, it's really, really widespread and it's mounting day to day. But there's a problem. The problem is that this evidence exists at very disconnected land scales. Okay? So on the tiny side of the land scales, there's plenty of uh, evidence from molecules in solution okay, that show that uh, this spin mediated phenomena at room temperature. For instance, in this uh, experiment here in the um, uh, top left, uh, experimentalists put cryptochrome in, a, in solution, in a vial, and uh, recorded the fluorescence, so cryptochrome absorbed light and then fluoresces, uh, as a function of the time during which the cryptochrome was excited with a laser. The first thing that you see is that this fluorescence uh, decays, because this means that we're killing the chromophore, we're destroying the sample, but as the experimentalists post a magnetic field on and off, okay, they saw that this fluorescence was modulated. Okay, uh, This is a um, uh, steady state phenomena. It's a bit different from uh, uh, what I meant with the envy center, but the idea is the same. Just by looking at how strongly this protein is fluorescing, we can actually infer if the spins statistically ended up in a singlet state, that is the, 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 the chemical reaction went this way, or if it's statistically the spins in this molecule ended up in a triplet state, that is the reaction took this path. And also some experiments show that cryptochrome could be quantum for 
uh, up to about one microsecond at room temperature, which is on par with the with the with the two microseconds that I that I quoted for the NV center uh, naturally occurring. So that's all well, but the next tier of evidence for this phenomenon is the consistent data that comes from very big systems like birds or flies. For instance, uh, during migration season, um, biophysicists can put birds inside a cage um, and then they, they just want to see to which side the birds want to, to go out, right? And then they can mess up with the external magnetic field so that the birds want to go out through different uh, uh, through different directions, but the coolest thing that they did, it hasn't been replicated yet, was the following. They, um, so in this mechanism that I was describing here, this electron was free and this electron was interacting with the molecule where it came from, right? Uh, this electron being free, this means that um, it uh, it will react to uh, it's it's so the, the assumption is that those spins are interacting with the magnetic field of the Earth, right? It's responded to the tiny magnetic field of the Earth. So um, the magnetic field of the Earth is 50 microtesla. So uh, if you if you uh, uh, calculate the Larmor frequency of this, the, the frequency of Larmor oscillation around this field, it's about one point something. Uh, megahertz. So what would happen if you applied a tiny little oscillating field onto the bird at the oscillating at the Larmor frequency? What do you guys think would happen? You're saying um, at the same uh, at the same megahertz, the one point. Yes. What happens to this mechanism if this mechanism is actually happening? What happens if you apply a even tiny oscillating magnetic field that oscillates at the Larmor frequency of this guy here? Well, I'll take a guess from your previous slide. Uh, yes. You're going to tip the tip the system. Well, actually, you're going to resonate. You're going to more than tip you're going to uh, make this guy here go crazy so that the magnetosensing, like the, 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 this concerted mechanism would actually be disturbed. What you're doing, what, what uh, researchers did, they applied, I think it's like 400 nanotesla um, field oscillating at the right frequency to make this guy go crazy, right? And uh, lo and behold, the birds, they didn't know where to go out anymore. Flies. Flies do not migrate, but they can be trained somehow, don't ask me how, to find food via the presence of a magnetic field. Uh, researchers trained them to do this. And then what researchers did was to knock out the cryptochrome gene from those flies and the flies could no longer find food based on magnetic fields. In a further experiment, researchers put back human cryptochrome inside the flies and the flies were back to finding the food via the magnetic field. All of this is absolutely consistent with this mechanism that I was telling to you about, but it's very hard to believe like anything, right? It's hard to believe that we go, that there's an unambiguous link between the spin chemistry and the, the things that happen at the bird and fly scale. So here's where we enter, right? We are developing, we want to bridge those land scales. And I started doing this at Stanford and I'm pushing it more at UCLA. What we want to do is start doing controlled uh, chemical-like or quantum sensing-like experiments on organisms at the nanoscale. What we want to do is look at individual cells and individual proteins inside cells and try to control the spins, say, in cryptochrome using the exact same mechanisms that we use with the nitrogen vacancy center. Uh, again, this protein fluoresces uh, differently depending on their spin states. So what we want to see here are different um, uh, levels of fluorescence in a living system. 
What we want is to explore quantum degrees of freedom at room temperature under noisy environment, okay, to bridge those land scales. I, 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 I'm talking for a long time here. I won't go through the, through the technical details, but our setup is quite special in that we have this fancy microscope that has single molecule resolution and has super low phototoxicity. That is, we are not going to kill the pigments. They're not going to bleach. Uh, this setup is called a lattice light sheet, and we're going to have a special tiny little coils around it, and we're going to have a detection system that has single photon uh, detection capabilities. And um, the thing that is a bit different from people, from experiments done in, usually in biology is that these experiments, they are driven by mathematical models, okay? So uh, we can take the models of what people think is happening in, 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 in chemistry and start uh, making predictions based on open quantum systems formalism of uh, what we should expect to see experimentally. Let me show you some simulations. Those are simulations, okay? Uh, I am dying to take those curves experimentally, but this is the type of curve that we want to look at in the lab. Uh, I won't have time to explain everything, but uh, what we do is we take some known parameters of um, the photophysics of this cryptochrome. And we couple those parameters with a simulation that has three spins. It's two electron spins and one nuclear spin that represents the hyperfine interactions of this guy with the molecule where it came from. And then you can start doing some uh, simple uh, simulations. And the result that I want to talk about is this top right plot here, okay? What I plot here is what I'm calling magnetosensitivity. And this is the magnetosensitivity um, over all angles as uh, what you would have in solution. This is the magnetosensitivity, this theoretical magnetosensitivity of cryptochrome, okay? As a function of the external magnetic field. Magnetic Magnetosensitivity is just a measure of, um, how much the protein can differentiate between reactions going this way or this way. Imagine that uh, for 50% of the time, the reaction went this way and 50% of the time, the reaction statistically went this way. The magnetosensitivity is very poor, right? It's, it's very, it, it's, it's random. But imagine that 90% of the times, the reaction proceeded to the singlet branch and 10% of the time, the reaction proceeded through the, the, the triplet branch. In this case, the magnetosensitivity for a given magnetic field is pretty good. So this is what's plotted here. And this is plotted as a function of the external field. What you can see here in this curve is that this curve is not monotonic. It goes up and down, okay? Very interestingly, and th those parameters, of course, depend a little bit on the simulation, on the, on the parameters of the simulation, but the idea is the same. It peaks very close to the magnetic field of the Earth, okay, which may or may not indicate that those molecules might have evolved to do exactly what they're doing. And this curve actually falls very rapidly for fields as tiny as the magnetic field of the, like 10 times the magnetic field of the Earth. Right. So this means that putting a, a very big magnet is not going to change like this specific phenomena. Right. Uh, this specific phenomena uh, is maybe optimized to work close to the magnetic field of the Earth and its effect goes down really, really quickly. And this is the kind of, of uh, plots that we would like to compare with experimental data to either confirm or refute this model at the nanoscale, right? I won't talk about that. Uh, I want to mention that this same physics might be way more important in biology than just magnetic field sensing for navigation. The same physics 
uh, have been shown to alter metabolic processes. So uh, bio biologists have this thing called a metabolic analyzer, where you put, say, a plate of cells inside and you do some mass spec reading of, of gas products of that, that those cells are producing. Um, Physicists uh, shielded one of those metabolic analyzers against external magnetic fields, put a plate of cells, and then applied tiny magnetic field on the order of like a couple of times the Earth inside. Okay, And then just by changing the direction of these magnetic fields, they saw at the level of the reading of thousands of cells, they saw significant, and I, I know the people who did this, I actually believe this, they saw readings uh, which were different readings as a function of magnetic field of respiration rates, uh, of production of free radicals, and also um, of acidification rates in those cells, in a way that is also consistent with this model. Also, uh, magnetic tiny magnetic fields are consistent with, with via the same mechanism, altering um, how stem cells grow, uh, how DNA gets repaired, okay? And it's actually not only biology, right? There are many other processes that might benefit from the control uh, or the exploration of, of magnetic fields. For instance, solar cells. Solar cells, uh, they are, uh, there is a parameter that uh, that measures how good or bad your solar cell is that has to do with the, it's called singlet fission and the singlet fission rates can be altered with different magnetic fields so the idea is and all through very similar spin physics the idea is can we start paying more attention to spin degrees of freedom right to build better electromagnetic probes to engineer uh, metabolic processes, right, for therapeutics, can we start driving those spin transitions? Or can we think about, it's not that we're, we're going to replace Google's uh, room temperature, uh, um, uh, ultra cold, like supercomputer, but can we learn with nature? If nature is using those quantum features, can we learn with it how it might be doing some sort of quantum computing at room temperature so that maybe there's something that we can learn? Right? Maybe that's some, there's something that we can learn so that our quantum laptop doesn't need to have a tiny refrigerator attached to it. Right? So I think there's a lot of things um, to be explored uh, if we think about controlling spins at room temperature. Uh, I won't talk about this, but what my group wants to, to think about them is like, can quantum physics be either established or refuted? If it's refuted, it's also good. It drives the science forward to account for those important biological phenomena at room temperature and importantly, be manipulated in the same way that technological quantum systems are manipulated and driven like for technological and like therapeutic advantage. And we're not alone in this. Some very recent uh, results, right, 17, 17, 19, those papers, those papers, they take a very similar, very quantum informational approach to some uh, phenomena in biology. So that's where we're going to go. We think we're in the right track. And I am not endorsing nature, but I'm endorsing this cover of nature. And I really think that um, joining forces from different sides is the way to, to tackle more exciting, more complex uh, problems. And if you see there, there's Doc Quantum there, a tiny Doc Quantum. So next time we play, I want to be Doc Quantum. So uh, with this, I hope you guys are convinced that we made the, uh, the, the, the round, right? And uh, I have just started my own lab about six months ago here at UCLA and uh, I would be super happy to talk to all of you about uh, collaborations, opportunities and contact me in, in my email which is memorable, it's just cla at ucla.edu. That's all I wanted to tell you today and may the quantum be with you. Thank you.